is over 422 million people globally live with diabetes, type 2 diabetes especially, most of it. Um, that is according to WHO in 2021 statistics. That's four years ago, right? Type 2 diabetes makes up 90 to 95% of all diabetic cases. That's according to the CDC in 2023. These are facts now. Fact number four, most people, most people do not know that they have diabetes until it is advanced. And one of the reasons for that is because your doctor cannot medically diagnose you until it reaches the range where she or he can say from their license point of view that you're diabetic. But some doctors will hint to you. They will say, you, you know, you need to get into, leave that sedentary lifestyle and get into an exercise mode because I'm seeing those numbers and they're on the higher side. But he or she cannot diagnose you. So the thing is, once we have indicators, or even before we have indicators, we can be proactive. And if we have indicators, we want to even be more proactive. And if we are diagnosed with diabetes, we want to be able to control it or reverse it. Okay? So whichever stage you are in, that is important. And number five, fact number five, lifestyle changes can help manage and even reverse some forms of diabetes. Lifestyle changes. I want to stress that, and this is from the ADA in 2022. I'm looking at the, the latest statistics. I want to stress that, and there's a reason, because some of us believe if we're diabetic, that we are just um, restrained to only medications for the rest of our lives. And that is not true. Now, there are some cases where it is true, but it's not true in every case. It is also not true that if you change your diet, for example, but you're still highly stressed or you're working in conditions that would induce the diabetes not related to diet, that you will be cured. So we're not, we're not talking absolutes here, but we're talking about average, we're talking about norms, and we're talking about possibilities. And that is very important to uh, bear in mind. So I wanted to share um, some of these facts with us. So let's define what is diabetes. Diabetes is a condition where your body cannot properly process glucose due to the problem with insulin. Either it's not enough or the cells stop responding. What are the types of diabetes? The types of diabetes that we know uh, would be type 1 diabetes, uh, which is usually called juvenile diabetes. It's found in, in younger children and teens. It's an autoimmune destruction of insulin cells. So the body is, for some reason, it's fighting against the cells, the insulin cells that are supposed to be regulating the blood sugar so once it's destroying these cells the blood sugar is elevated and that person would um, be diabetic in that case they require insulin so they're injected in insulin or you know there are multiple forms now that they get um, insulin and it's usually pediatric it begins in childhood now there's also type 2 diabetes which is insulin resistant and it's generally 95% of the times, it's lifestyle driven. Now, <clears throat> when you go to your doctor, the doctors would ask you for your family history and to see if anyone, any, if it's your parent or grandparent or uncles or aunts, if they are diabetic. And once you say yes, the doctors are thinking, okay, the possibility of you being a, a diabetic or getting diabetes is significantly enhanced. But that is not always the case. Because as we just saw, it's mainly, in many cases, it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's lifestyle induced. Okay? So the insulin resistance is generally, in most cases, driven by how we live our lives. 
It is often, type 2 is often preventable, even if you have a family history of diabetes. Think about it. If mommy grew up um, giving us meals that are very conducive to diabetes, and we have our own families, and we carry on that, you know, we perpetuate that same tradition, you expect what mommy and daddy suffered with will always, you know, pass on to us. We will get it because we're doing the same thing. Uh, Okay, so think of it that way. But if we change and we decide to eat healthier and to control our stress differently and so forth, we can significantly reduce our chances. And and again, type 2 diabetes in many cases is reversible, especially if you're still producing insulin, but you are producing insufficient insulin. Again, going back to the analogy of the the, uh, insulin being the key, it may mean that your key is tinked and there's a tink on the key so it doesn't really fit to unlock the door. And if you cut a, a new key, it's going to work properly. There might be a play in the deadlock and so you might have to play with it before it actually opens it. Think of it in the same way. It's the same analogy. Just more science, but it's the same analogy. So for example, if there's a kink and it depends on where on your journey you are, it might be easier to reverse. But there are sometimes, no matter how much you change the key, this door is just dead and you have to remove the entire door and change the entire apparatus for, 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 for the door. So, and, and in that case, because it's so advanced, the treatment may not take effect or the, 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 the time interval for the effects would not allow for that patient to be reversed from the condition. So it's important to understand that when you're talking about treatment and even um, even reversal of diabetes. Then there is the gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes has to do with um, pregnancy-induced insulin resistance because of all of the physiological or the psychophysiological um, trauma that is going on in the body of the mom. It can trigger gestational um, diabetes. And it may resolve after birth, but it increases future risk for the mother and also sometimes for the uh, for the uh, fetus or for the child. Now, there's a very popular, it's not really fully diagnosed uh, medically that way, but a number of doctors are speaking about it right now where they call uh, dementia type 3 diabetes because a lot of studies now are, are indicating that uh, most of the, the, the disease associated with, with dementia shows inflammation in the brain that is significantly increased with processed sugar. And that's why if you, are, if you, if you see a neurologist or your neurosurgeon or you are going for checkups with, you have uh, things like uh, dementia, if it's uh, you know, Alzheimer's and so forth, one of the things that the doctors really, really stress quite a lot now, at least most of them, is the whole concept of your sugar intake. Because there's a direct correlation scientifically. Because again, remember, remember that most of the serotonin that is for, for, for moods and, 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 and our emotional stability, where is it made? In the gut. And it's traveling to the brain via the vagus nerve. So if your gut is inflamed, guess what? Your brain is also inflamed. And the chronic inflammation in the brain is often uh, you know, interpreted as being the, the uh, dementia. So it's so important, beloved. It's so important. Inflammation anywhere in the body is inflammation everywhere in the body. What is insulin? Well, insulin is really a, a hormone. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a hormone that is responsible for regulation. It's a regulatory hormone. But it's also a fat storage hormone. So don't you ever think of insulin only in terms of controlling blood sugar. It also stores fats. And that creates... Uh, even more uh, simplicity in understanding diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes. So you ask me, uh, what is the role of insulin? And I'm glad you asked. 
I mentioned it before, but again, let me just mention it, not in terms of all of the biochemistry behind it, but simply by saying, I think of insulin as a key that unlocks the cell doors so sugar can enter. Without it, sugar stay in the bloodstream causing damage. Let me just break this down a bit. When we consume food to harness the energy from the food, it goes through a process we call cellular respiration. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to break the food down so our bodies can get the benefit from the food. We begin that process by what we call mastication, the chewing, the mechanical chewing of the food in the mouth. Right in the mouth, there is an enzyme called amylase. Amylase begins the process of breaking down the sugars that we eat. If we eat from a healthy source of sugar, which is organic sugar or low glycemic foods, or foods that are not ultra processed or, or, or processed food in general, from the time the food leaves the mouth, the buccal cavity, and it goes down into our system, the alimentary canal, God has designed the body in such a way that it has these enzymes. And anytime you hear ASC, it usually refers to um, an enzyme. That's why I said amylase breaks down starch. <clears throat> and then you get into the stomach, you get into the uh, various areas of the, uh, micro, uh, the um, digestive tract. And over time, when we consume the right sources of sugar, especially, for example, in, in, in fruits, we eat organically grown fruits, the fiber allows for that sugar to be time released into our system. So that's why it wouldn't just spike our sugars. The islets of Langerhans in the pancreas has to secrete tremendous amount of insulin to keep that sugar regulated under control. So the insulin is the key, and we call it in science the doorbell genes. Uh, my key may fit into your lock, but because it's not designed, it's not going to open the door. Or it may not even fit. Think of insulin that way. When the, when the, when the, when the sugar comes into the body, the sugar wants to get into the cell to provide the energy that we need. Without insulin opening the door, that sugar goes directly into the bloodstream. And when it goes into the bloodstream, your blood sugar is elevated so quickly, the body recognizes the crisis, and the body, the same insulin now tries to do something about that crisis. And you know what it tries to do? It tries to store that fat. It tries to sh store, sorry, that sugar. And how does it store it? In fats. In places where we don't want it to be stored. That's one of the ways we develop fatty liver syndrome. Because remember, glycerol is stored in the liver as fat to break down if we have insufficient fat. Where does it store it? In the abdominal regions. And what does that do? It compresses the other organs. Where does it store it? In arteries. What results from that? Atherosclerosis. The hardening, the thickening of the arteries, increasing what? LDLs, the bad cholesterol. So we also have cardiovascular problem. And the blood has to be pumped at a higher pressure. So guess what? It causes and influences things like high blood pressure. 